Turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We'll take Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. And come through down by verse uh, 24 somewhere. And this story in Luke chapter 15 is a famous story. If you read your Bible at all, uh, you'll, you'll recognize the text. There are certain stories in the Bible that are universal. Everybody knows about them. Uh, there's hardly anybody in America that doesn't know about Daniel and the lion's den. That's just there. And, and stories like Jonah and the whale. See, those kind of stories. And everybody's familiar with those things. They're part of the American uh, literature heritage. And that Bible has been translated into 160 different languages, so it's pretty universal. Uh, Daniel Lyons, Dan, and Jonah and the Whale, you know, David and Goliath, you know those stories? Uh, those stories like that are, are commonly known, and you, the, what, the story about the rich man in hell, that's commonly known. And this one here is, this is called the story of the prodigal son. And the prodigal, the word prodigal means spendthrift. Uh, the word prodigal means a person who wastes things and throws away things, throws away his talent, wastes his life. And we, so when we talk about the story of the prodigal son, we're talking about a young man who is wasteful. And uh, Luke chapter 15, start at verse 11, see how he starts. And in verse 11 he says, There was a certain man that had two sons. And the younger said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. And so he divided them his living. Not many days after, the younger gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, he says, and wasted his sons with riotous living. Or now he says, of a certain man that had two sons, and the younger. Now you might have known him been the younger. The younger son said, there's something about a young man when he gets to be about 16, he's smarter than he ever be again the rest of his life, <laughs> and has all the answers. Girl, it's about 13. Something happens to a girl about 13, she goes all to pieces. And they call it, you know, puberty and adolescence. I don't know what it is for the, for the devil as far as I'm concerned. But you'd think they get that young, that young coming up, you know, and they never know quite as much again as they know then. And the younger said, uh, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. And so he divided them his living. And not many days after. In not many days after, you think about the far country that you get there. And the young man got together what he had and took off. He's going to conquer the world. Uh, old Chinese saying, he go who go out to work, set world on fire, soon come back for more matches. <laughs> and you see, you see people, young people doing day crazy stuff. You ever see these kids hitchhike out in here, you know, 17, 18, 9 years old with a backpack on? They're working harder than if they worked in a coal mine at 20 cents an hour, man. Out there in the rain, sleeping in the rain, they get mugged the first night they're out and they're carrying junk with them the rest of the time. What a, what a, what a, what a dumb thing to do. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I don't have to go back and come through again. Our folks say, oh, if just to be young again, I wouldn't want to be young again for nothing. I wouldn't want to go back and be 15 or 16 or 17 for nothing. Um, you can have it. <laughs> uh, you take you young people I'm talking to right now, you're in one of the most uh, depraved, rotten, dangerous generations ever showed up on this earth. And I wouldn't want to go back and come through again. I'd probably wind up hell going through the next time. I probably, I probably wouldn't get through it. Back when I was a boy coming up, if a young man was, uh, you know, if a young man was, oh, 15, and he was smoking and drinking at 15, he's considered a bad cat. But your bunch, your bunch are on dope at 12. Your bunch, I know your bunch, you're on dope at 12. And that's, that isn't progress. Darwin didn't know what he was talking about. He might have been a monkey man, but anybody with any sense wouldn't be. You ought to know your relatives better than I know them. I was going around saying, you know, once I was a tadpole when I began to begin, then I was a monkey with my tail tucked in. And next I was a mon next I was a monkey, no, I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Next I was a monkey in a banyan tree, and now I'm a doctor with a PhD. <laughs> and that isn't true. You don't come up like that. You don't go from puddle to paradise. You went from paradise, Genesis to three, to puddle is where you went. I don't envy young people in America today. I know what they're up against, and it's plenty. Uh, you go to middle school, and they don't uh, tell you how you dress or how you should dress. They don't give you a Bible. They don't even allow you to bring a Bible to school. And the first time you get in the slammer, the first thing they'll do is give you a Bible. 
That way you're shot before they tell you the truth. That's a dirty trick to pull on young people. Well, the young, a young, the young man, young man said, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth unto me. And so he divided him his living. The old man said, Son, uh, uh, I hope you don't go. I'm going. I'm tired of people around here telling me what time to get in and uh, uh, curfew and all that stuff. I'm a man, man. I want to do my own way. Beat it. Get out of my way. Old man said, Son, you're foolish and you're young. You know what you're doing? Oh, shut up. I'm tired of getting preached out. I want to go. Old man said, I'm praying you won't go. He said, I'm going. The old man said, I hope you won't go. Bam, went the door, and out he went. Now, you know what that means? That means God won't make you be good. Yes. Some of you are waiting for Calvin to predestinate you into something or other, <laughs> but you ain't going to make it. <laughs> I'll tell you how that thing is. When you lean toward God, he leans toward you. And when you lean toward the devil, he leans toward you. And he didn't, he didn't want the boy to go. Tried to stop him. He wouldn't go. He wouldn't, wouldn't stay and went anyway. Uh, I don't want to see you go to hell. I don't relish talking about people in hell. My mother's in hell. Father's in hell. Two uncles and an aunt in hell. Most of them died chronic alcoholic. I don't get any thrill out of preaching about hell. If that book is right, someday I'm going to see my mother standing right there in the judgment. Revelation 20. You hear the Lord say, Depart from you, curse of everlasting fire. Do you think I enjoy thinking about that? I believe the book. Maybe you don't, but I do. And if I believe it, that's what's going to happen. I read my Bible, God doesn't wipe away all tears from their eyes until after that judgment. There's going to be some bawling going on at that judgment. I don't like to think about those things. But you take this business here, young fella, God won't make you be good. Now, if you decide you want to be good, God will help you. If you want to be a clean-cut young man and be an honor to your, your father and your family and your country and your God and have God use you, all you got to do is lean toward God and he'll lean toward you. And if you want to grow up and be one of these pied sap heads hanging around a gasoline station blowing the smoke out your ears and talking about the hypocrites in the church, and then the devil will help you. Uh, the devil can't make you bad and God can't make you good. But when you lean that way, they lean toward you. You young lady sitting there, what, do you, what kind of woman do you want to be when you grow up anyway? You want to be like one of these sluts you see in the head, uh, front of good housekeeping and uh, what, these magazines in the uh, rack today, in 1920, that stuff would be all called pornographic. 200 magazines at a shot. That kind of woman you want to be? A bunch of men trailing around after you like a pack of dogs? You want to be that kind of woman? You be that kind of woman. Well, this country is filled with that kind of woman. You grow up there, you know, if you want to be that kind, then wind up with a busted home and a busted heart and a life shot to pieces, the devil will help you. Just lean toward him, he'll lean toward you. Now, if you want to be a decent young lady and be treated like a lady, uh, men are smarter than you think they are, ladies. They know a lady when they see one. And if you want to be treated like a lady, then dress like a lady and talk like a lady and act like a lady and look like a lady. If you want to be treated like a whore or a slut, then just follow Hollywood and the news media. Amen, 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 amen and amen. That's all there is to it. All right. And I, if a certain man had two sons. The younger said, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth unto me. And he took his journey to a far country. You say, where's the far country? Well, it could be anywhere these days. Uh, back when I was a boy, you had to go quite a distance before you'd wind up in a hellish place. Somebody told me one time to go to hell, and I went to the French Quarter in New Orleans because that's the nearest place I could find to it. <laughs> but you take back the days, you might have had to go to Hell's Half Acre in Honolulu or Chinatown over in Miller or one of those places or Vegas or Mexico City. You don't have to travel as far these days. You don't have to be to Chicago to be in a, in a hellish, damnable place. They've got child pornography rings in Vermont, in the country. Now, where'd they get that stuff from? Where'd country people get the idea that you got it from the city? That's where you got it from. You got it from Hollywood, Chicago, and New York. That's where you got it from. All that kind of business. The far country. Now, a fellow said one time, he said, sitting right here in this church, you could be in the far country. And right now, sitting here in this church, if you love any book more than you love the Bible... And if you love anybody more than you love Jesus Christ, and if any hope is more precious to you than the hope of heaven, you've already started for the far country. Just a matter of time before you're going to go there. There's stuff going on now in little old towns in Wisconsin and Minnesota of populations of a thousand that God sunk Sodom and Gomorrah into fire for doing. And if you don't know that, you never drove a taxi cab. <laughs> I'm going to hell in a mile a minute. And the young man said, I want to get out there and do what I want to do when I want to do it, and not many days after. Got thinking about it. 
about the far country. You got reading about it. And not many days after, off he went and wasted his substance. Train up a child the way he should go, and he's old, he'll not depart from it. And my father got thinking about it, and thinking about it, daydreaming about it, and pretty soon he's gone. Like I say, I don't envy. I don't. I don't envy young people at all. This fellow said, "I'm going to do what I want to do. When I want to do it." You know, he got all got my, give him an earring along with it. You know, help him out. And that, that's 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 the bunch. Now, the father didn't want him to go, but off he went. The father tried to persuade him to stay, but he wouldn't stay. And you're a free moral agent. If you want to go to hell, there's the door. Help yourself. Bye bye. See you later. You say, oh, you're so crude and mean. Rock. No, I just got good sense. I know people. I know, I know a spring chicken boy. Let me tell you, you know what I've learned being preaching for 54 years? I've learned that if a man wants the truth, he'll take it no matter how you give it to him. And if he doesn't want the truth, he won't take it no matter how you fix it up. And you can sugar it up and butter it up and make it like honey and work it well, he still won't take it. So when I preach, what I do is just I take a shovel like this and get a scoop, and I say, hup, catch, there it goes. <laughs> you want it, get it. You don't want to leave it alone. You know what's, you know what's wrong? The far country no longer is this. The country is the city, and the city is the country. There isn't any country left. When I was a boy, we sang a song, uh, I want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. She was a pearl and the only girl daddy ever had. Good old fashioned girl with heart so true. One who loved nobody else but you. Now you boys looking for a bride, where are you going to find one of them? In a public high school? <laughs> By the time those girls have been through there, they've been mating around the backseat of cars like a pack of barnyard animals. And half of them is shacked up with everybody but the janitor. <laughs> I mean, they've come together. When I was a boy, we had a railroad track right down the middle of the town. We talked about folks the other side of the tracks. You know what we're talking about? Which all the respectable folks live on this side of the track and all the trash lived on that side of the track. But there's no railroad track going through anymore. And if you went to the biggest, richest doctors and lawyers in this town and their homes, you'd find African sex music booming out of boom boxes all over that cotton picking house. Amen. I'm not pulling your leg. Go check them. I remember when Tom was out there, and it's, 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 it's a matter of, it's, where would you find a country girl? If you got back in the boonies way back in Virginia or North Carolina where I sometimes preach, and step in there, that, that, there's that boob tube right over there in the corner, and there's a Sears Roebuck catalog with all the girliest sporting underwear in it, and there's a picture of Elvis up there, you know, or some other jackass. <laughs> Sit there and Tom for the things. You, there isn't any country anymore. It's all gone. Back in the old days when a guy would court his girl, he'd have to sit out there in the parlor and a chaperone in the next room, you know. And that old grandfather clock would be behind him, you know, and he'd be sitting there talking with his girl, you know, and courting her. You know, and trying to steal a kiss, you know, and that clock is going. You know what it's doing? It's saying, take your time, take your time, take your time, take your time, take your time. Now they're in the back seat of a car and they've got these little watches and they're going. <laughs> it's all picked up. <laughs> I was out there in Carolina preaching way back in the boonies there, and right before church I'd walk around about a quarter of a mile there and pray before I came to church, and I'm just looking, noticing the landscape, and uh, Carolina dry landscape is, is great. I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm, really, I'm really a coward at heart. I've really been try running from life all my life. Really, I have. I've had to face it. I've never wanted to be a leader. I care nothing about eating anybody. I don't care nothing about getting anybody orders. I, if, if, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take the city of Chicago if you gave it to me. Literally, the whole city. I'd dump it. I'd get rid of it. I'd be fool with the cotton picking thing. And I, but I've always been put in place of leadership. Right now, I'm having to teach 200 young people the Bible, anywhere from, oh, 17 up to 50, four nights a week. And I've got a pass of 700 active members. Then I've got to correspond with over 400 prisoners in jail and over 400 native missionaries overseas in four countries. I've got 45 young men I've trained myself on the foreign field preaching eight different languages. I've had to raise 10 children and 14 grandchildren. And I never asked for any of it. I tend to shrink. You know what my idea of living is? I guess I've got some African blood in me. <laughs> I mean, I, you know what I really enjoy? I enjoy just lying down on the bank of a river on a, on a spring day under a mimosa tree and eat me some, uh, oh, uh, yellow rice and uh, Spanish rice and fried mullet 
and fried uh, okra with some pepper sauce on it, or maybe some homemade tacos with real, you know, stuff in them, not just the canned guacamole, you know, but the real stuff in them, and 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 jalapenos a couple there on top of uh, of, of Swiss cheese. And this put on a earphone with Mozart playing something, and this let the world go to hell. <laughs> That's my idea of a good time. I never could do that, but I, I'd like to run back to North Carolina and take a generator and go back there and build me a place where you couldn't hit, hit your neighbor with a 22. <laughs> but I'll never get there. Uh, you can't have any ministry back in there. You, you know, place to have a ministry? Place like Chicago. I mean, you want a center? The woods are full of them. <laughs> And I'm walking around there praying, you know, when I pass by a fellow's place out there and he covered it for a while, you know, looking at it. Some farmer got him a thing there off a dirt road, and the dirt road is a quarter of a mile from a blacktop. And he got these big old pine trees and oaks sitting out there and 40 acres, boy, a huge old ranch-style house made out of logs. Boy, what a beautiful place, man. And then right out in front, here's this great big solar disk sitting out here. So what's in that guy's house? A bunch of half-nude women doing the bumps and the grinds, boy. Don't you know? That's what bumps and the grinds, that's what they call it. Now, if you don't know that, you never worked in a nightclub. But I've served drinks out of them. I know what they call it. I know what that stuff is. Don't kid me. I know what jazz means. Now, you don't. And the people who write the jazz articles, they don't either. And if they did, they wouldn't use the word. Well, I raised up there... Back in thirty in the thirties and forties, playing the jazz band, I know where the word jazz comes from. I wouldn't repeat it in public. You see that thing that you lost that distinction. You all got together. Why they built you a beautiful house way back in the back of nowhere with all the animals and stuff to get away from the city, and then drag the cotton picking city right in your living room? That's a dumb thing to do. All right, the old man said, "Don't go." And I imagine the older brother said some things about it too, although he's not recorded as saying anything about it. And the Bible said, and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. Uh, the young man went out and he was inexperienced. He didn't know the world. Uh, he don't know what they do in the world. I know what they do out in the world. I know what everybody does in 24,000 miles in every direction. I've been all those places, but I've, I've got some miles on me. I traveled 40,000 a year by plane for 52 years. 40,000 a year. I've been up in the air longer than a seagull with sore feet. <laughs> And I preached over there on the streets in Korea, and my interpreter of the Song Lee over there. I preached over in the Ukraine, my interpreter of Major Taurus, KJB converted fella. I preached over in Germany, Rudiger Hemmer translates for me there. I preached in Mexico, Weldon Jones translates for me there. I preached someplace else over in Hyderabad and Bombay, and Kumar translates for me there, and all that kind of stuff. You know what people do out in the world? They make a living. See? If you ever go up to Montana and it says, uh, uh, deep sea fishing off Key West, come there, you go down to Key West, and it says, see the Blue Ridge in the fall. You go up to the Blue Ridge and it says, see the painted desert in the Grand Canyon. You go out there and it says, come to Seattle and fish for salmon. You go up there and then it says, see the beautiful Canada. What are you doing? You know what they're doing? They're trying to get you to just go and go and when you get there, you know what they're doing? They're selling and buying and selling and buying and selling and buying. You ever see Waikiki Beach? I mean, the original. It ain't that thing that goes straight out to Diamond Head, you know. That's uh, that thing they they made public beach. Now that that stuff was private beaches. Waikiki Beach in World War II was just the land in front of the uh, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. You couldn't have parked 45 cars in that beach. Those rooms in 1947 and 4046 were 25 dollars a piece for a single back in there. Well, a single, 25 bucks a piece a night. Now, what they are now, you probably couldn't even hardly say. But you see that beautiful Montecora in the moonlight and, and sweet Leilani, heavenly flower and all that kind of stuff. And you think of this beautiful romantic thing, you know. They're making money, boy, hand over fist. They make money. That's what they do. They work and make money. And this fella starts out, are you going to really go off on your young, own young fella and tell your mom and daddy where to go and ignore them and be your own boss, do what you want to do? You better have some shekels on you, boy. When you get out there, it's they ain't nothing free. You gonna pay for it. They're all making a living. Or right, if the younger said, "Father, give me the portion of goods that fall unto me," and so he divided them his living, and not many days after, and if not many days after, you get thinking about it and dreaming about it and joking about it and talking about it, and pretty soon you're gonna go. 
And uh, I, I preached the prodigal son all over this country and big, big huge uh, uh, young people's rallies and stuff, sometimes 1,200 in there. I used to preach for all the Baptist, independent Baptist churches in Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan every summer at Camp, Camp Chautauqua. And I've seen congregations there of 800 and 1,200 kids and drawn this picture for them. And I've seen kids come down there when they got through praying at that altar. You could mop that thing up with a mop, tears. A uh, bunch of kids came to me one night and told me what's happened back there where they were sitting, where their girlfriend wanted to come down and her boyfriend was on the save. She's a little squirt, about 50 years old, her boyfriend was about 18. And they told me back there that thing came and she turned to her boyfriend and she was crying. And she said, Jim, won't you go down with me and get saved? He said, no, I ain't going down there. He said, I, I wish you'd go down there. I'll go down with you. If you come down, come down. He said, let's go to the far country. And she said, I'm afraid to. And he said, why? Said, we, she said, we might not ever get back. He said, well, Ruckman got back. If he can do it, I can do it. You better watch that stuff, kid. Ruckman got back, did he? What did he leave behind when he left? Ruckman got back, did he? Where's all Ruckman's buddies? You seen him around here anywhere? How many of you fellows are World War II veterans? Let me see your hand. World War II. Where are my buddies? I'll tell you where the other did in hell. The bunch I came up with. Or in TV sanitariums or in nut houses. Or in rescue missions. You better hadn't take a chance like that. Maybe God isn't going to use you. You better watch your step. A certain man had two sons, and one said, Father, give me the portion of good as thought of me, and so he divided them his living. And not many days after, it didn't take long, he took his journey to the far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. He went down and got him in a disco or something like that. Back when I was a boy coming up, they called them uh, juke joints. Juke joints. Uh, juke joint was an upholstered sewer with indirect lighting for both sexes. <laughs> And you had different styles, you joints. I mean, it depends upon how much you made as to as to where you went. I mean, if you made, you know, uh, uh, maybe you made a uh, oh, dollar an hour, you wound up in a, you out there, you know, in a honky tonk place, you know, and with the honky tonk angels and, and uh, uh, Tex Williams, Eddie Arnold, and uh, uh, Hank Williams, and that bunch were all saying, you know, you know, kick me in the head with a beer can blues, or my wife left me, or your wife left yours, who cares who comes back? <laughs> and the beer was 15 cents a can. Now, if you made a little bit more, a couple of dollars an hour, then you went to the, uh, oh, you went to the, to the, uh, wet Meadow Acres Ballroom in Topeka, Kansas, or the Steel Pier in Atlantic City, and Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey played, you know, and Joe Stafford sang, I went to your wedding, or danced at your wedding, or got drunk at your wedding, or puked at your wedding, or something or other. And then, but the beer was more expensive. Their beer was 25 cents a bottle. You see, you come up from cans to bottles. And if you made five, six dollars an hour, and seven dollars an hour, this is back in the thirties, see. And back in there, uh, you making pretty good money. Back those days, five dollars an hour, real good money. If you made that much, you went to the Waldorf Astoria or the Edgewater Beach Hotel in downtown Chicago, and Xavier Cougar played La Compasita and the women tango, wore evening dresses, and the champagne was twelve bucks a glass. The different levels of sin. And these Americans, they think sin in blue jeans, you know, and gingham and calico is really bad, wicked stuff. But if you dress it up in lace and and velvet and start driving Mercedes Benz around and Porsches around, that makes you decent. I don't make you decent. Just a different level of sin. You can't do nothing with sin. Sin is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. I mean, sin just like beans. I don't care what you do with beans. Beans are still beans, and you can take beans and roast them or toast them or bake them or fry them or make ice cream out of them. And when you got through, you got beans. <laughs> what you got? Anyway, he said this, he said, boy, I'm going to go down there and get me in a nightclub, and I'm going to get me a blonde on one side and a brunette on the other, and I'm going to get me a Cadillac or a Porsche, you know, or Audi, and I'm going to drive back to the sick town, and I'm going to show them they can't treat me like this. I'm a man, <laughs> you know. No, I'll tell you what he is, he's a chump about to get his head cut off. Now, you say, why? Well, it's, it's, it's commercial. It isn't what it looks like. It's all commercial. There's a buck back there somewhere. See this young lady? She's, uh, she's here in a juke joint, and she's uh, living high on the hog and low on the chicken, she thinks. And you take her, you take her mother was a harlot, and her daddy was a drunkard, and she wouldn't know the gospel if you saw it in daylight. You think she's happy? You say, oh, yes, she's happy. No, she's not. You say, well, yes, she is. No, she's not. 
You said, well, I can see, Brother Ruckman, she's smiling. No, she's not smiling. You said, Brother Ruckman, I see my two eyes, she's smiling. No, she's not. I just drew it to make it look that way. You see? And when the devil wants to get you, you know what he'll do to you? He'll paint sin up till she smiles like a May Queen, and you'll think, aren't those people happy? No, they're not happy. They're not happy. And I played in those places. I mean, try diddly diddly and all those sorry houses, you know, Della Della out in the Sigma Nu and Kappa Nu and all that kind of stuff, and played for the Kiwanis, you know, and the owls and the bats and the buzzers and the kooks and all that business, and played for the USOs, not UFO, USO, <laughs> and played for those places. You know what people do in those places? They come and show up their boyfriends and their girlfriends and their clothes to convince you they're happy when they're just about that step in suicide. Most of them. You say, how do you know that? By the kind of songs they like. Uh, people, the songs that last out there in the world are not the happy songs. Uh, you take these, they have, every now and then one of these cute little songs come up, you know. We had them called Maresy Dokes and Dozy Dokes and Little Amsy Divey, you know, and boop, boop, get them, got them, lot them, shoot, and making happy tracks, and I believe, I believe. Those songs don't last. You know the kind of songs that last out there? I mean, I hear them occasionally played in radio, and they've been playing, I've heard them for almost 60 years. A song like, uh, uh, sometimes I wonder why I spend the lonely nights dreaming of a song. That melody haunts my reverie, and I am once again with you when our love was new, and each kiss an inspiration. Those last. You know what kind of songs last out there? They're the song of broken hearts. You know why? Because unsaved people are miserable. And they make themselves look happy and act happy, but they ain't happy. The way of the transgressors is hard. I know the kind of songs that last out there. I know them, you know. Oh, don't let the begin the begin. Let the love that once was a fire remain an ember. Let it sleep like the dead desire I only remember. They last. Hank would get up and sing these songs. He'd come in and cuss his audience, and they'd laugh and cheer. And he'd sing about his blues, died alcoholic hearts, you know. Didn't never made 50. Press it didn't either. You know why those big shots are, are sing those unhappy songs? Because they're miserable. That's why people like to hear them, because they're miserable. They, they have, they have a, a rapport with each other. Let me tell you something. The time comes to die. You don't want some nut coming to your place there and sitting and singing you some piece of rock music, you know. You ain't nothing but a hound dog or something like that. Or ACDC coming in there, you know. And you, When you come to die, you want to have somebody come and sit by your bed and read you John chapter 14, and hold your hang, and sing, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. You don't want that a worldly crap. You know how long Christians have been singing the sweet by and by? Why don't you get your songbook and look the date on it? You don't know, you don't know one rock song that has stayed popular for eight years. You can't name one. And nobody buys the sheet music to it. When I came up, they'd buy the sheet music, the popular songs, and play them in their own homes. Nobody buys this modern junk. You know why? It ain't worth listening to. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> there they are. Now, see that thing right there? Now, you say she's smiling. No, you make it look like she's smiling. So you, you pay, I just painted it, see? That's what they do in the, in the news media and on the radio and on television places like that. They present sinners as cheerful and happy. It's a wonderful comedy. You know, it's all full of fornication from start to finish. And these people, they're miserable, they're miserable. You read about a young lady there, you go by there and you see a big ad out there in the street and the billboard, uh, with a song in my heart, you know, and <laughs> she's out there, oh, some woman always smiling at you all the time, half dressed. <laughs> <laughs> and you pick up a newspaper about three months later and she'd pop the pills lying there dead and has old 50 people at her funeral. That woman who wrote Peyton Place had 25 people come to her funeral. That national TV vote. Soap opera. Twenty-five people. I've had old women in my church down there, farm women, just as homely as a mud fence. <laughs> and when they died, they had 200 people come to the funeral. You're in the wrong track. Those, those songs aren't the right kind of songs. Uh, you take, you take what they do is they make them smile on the camera. Most of you fellas now, you gotta see a newscast once in a while. Because all the new casters now are professional Hollywood models. It ain't nothing they're saying that's worth hearing. You just look at something, that's what you're looking at. And they're standing there blinking, reading the sign off the camera. 
Don't kid me. They don't, they don't, they don't memorize that stuff they give you newscasts. That thing's on the camera where they can look right at the camera and read off the script off the top of it. See? I've, I've done radio screenplays and uh, radio plays and screenplays and adapted books to, to movies, uh, what they call uh, uh, the, the man who makes up the shots, you know, uh, sketches each shot before the camera does it. That stuff is all fake. That woman will be before that camera, you know. <laughs> then she gets off the camera. Hey, Joe, get me a blankety blank drink out of that blankety blank. Yeah, man. Yeah, boy. I mean, haven't you noticed how pretty teeth all those models have? They make beautiful false teeth. <laughs> Most of those things are homemade teeth you're looking at. Do you know that? That stuff is all set up like that. It's fake, 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 fakey. That's what it is. All right, now here they are. Here's this girl here. She's over here, and she's just came with a bad life, knows nothing, no gospel, no Christianity, no Bible, no church, no nothing. You think she's happy? Well, she's smiling. They are told to smile. They're paid to smile. You can't buy anything without a grinning woman like that. If you're buying a new refrigerator, there she is in evening get dressed by the, by the, by the refrigerator. <laughs> you buy your car, she's up in the automobile in a bathing suit. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. Now, what's that for? It's to make you think they're happy. They're not happy. They're not happy. Now, see this girl over here? She's raised in a Christian church. And she went down there, you know, with the beginners, you know. They come down before church. They'd stand there and they'd say, Jesus loved me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are sweet, weak. He is strong. Yes, Jesus loved me. Raised in a Christian home. You say, what's she doing in a, in a, in a mud wallow like that? <laughs> Well, uh, as a jewel of gold is in the swine's snout, so is a fair woman is without discretion. And the, the sow has returned to her wallowing in the mire. Now, sister, if you're one of the Lord's sheep, you better get something to settle. You can't be happy in a mud hole. Sheep have no way of cleansing themselves. Other animals can rub against the fence and scrape the stuff off or jump in the water and get rid of it. That sheep, when he goes down and comes out of that water, is just kind of a dirty, muddy, gray, and brown. The shepherd has to clean him. The shepherd has to clean him. The shepherd has to clean him. He can't clean himself. You say, well, those people, yeah, you envy him. You look at him, you're jealous of him. And if I was going to give any young people any kind of advice for anything, I wouldn't waste five minutes with this Chuck Swindoll, Charles Stanley, uh, sharing, caring, family, pressure, tension, bunk. I would tell you if you're a young person, don't ever be envious of unsaved people. That's what I'd tell you. And when you see what they do, well, I don't never done that before, and I wonder what it's like to do that. Don't you mess around to find out. You're going to waste your time. I count 27 years of my life just total waste. Just shot. And I resent it. I still resent it. I resent the religious dignitaries that didn't tell me how to be saved and didn't give me a chance. I'll always resent it. But that's how it is. Now, you take this young lady right here. What's she doing? She's learning how to smoke. Let me tell you, the dumbest thing you ever seen in your life is a young girl learn how to smoke. You ever see that? And the guy sits there and he throws up the cigarettes, three of them higher. Well, three of them up, one of them higher than the other two. And she says, thank you, and takes one. And, and she taps it in the wrist, and then she taps it in the plate, and then she taps it in the table. She doesn't know what she's tapping it for, but she's seen him do it in the movies. <laughs> and then she puts the other end in her mouth. <laughs> And sticks out of her neck like an ostrich, and that guy takes his flick a blick and pops that thing and almost burns a corsage off. And she sits back there and <sighs> inhales. She doesn't know what to do with it, see? I mean, she wants to recline on a divan like Rita Hayworth, you know, or Farrah Fawcett, or <sighs> you know, that kind of thing. But she do not know how to do it, so she got this like this, and I mean, she doesn't just dare blow it out. I mean, that would be unsophisticated to go. <laughs> so about that time, her boyfriend turns and looks at her, you know, and she goes, just swallows it. <laughs> then turns green in the face, just as sick as a sick sow in a snowstorm. You know something? If you young people make a bigger fool out of yourself for Christ's sake, as some of you are going to do for the devil's sake, you'd have revival around here all the time. Yes, sir. The trouble is you worry about it. What do they think? What do they think? You worry about what your peers think. What, what do you care what they think? If they thought right, they'd want the best for you. They wouldn't get you into trouble. Isn't it strange? You know, a fellow gets saved, any fellow. When a fellow gets saved, any fellow. 
and get saved. You know, the first thing he does, he remembers every person that witnessed to him or prayed for him or tried to get him right and goes back and thanks him. Do you think he goes back to the bunch that taught him how to use the stuff? The birth control pills, you ladies, and learn how to play five card stud, the seven card draw, deuces wild. You think he goes back to that crowd and taught him how to shoot pool? Well, he don't. You know that bunch. You know that, oh, that bunch, nothing. Down there in Pensacola, I am, I still preach on the street. I preach on the street every spring and every summer, April, May, June, July, August. I preach on the street right in the town where I've been for 50 years. Where my milkman can see me, my mailman, a TV repairman, and my doctors and lawyers see me outside there making a fool out of myself for Christ's sake. It don't bother me a bit. You know why? I don't owe them nothing. All that, they didn't tell me how to get saved. They didn't care whether I went to hell or not. The, the, the world owes me a living there behind three payments, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me a bit, you know, to offend them. But you're so worried about offending somebody, upsetting somebody. Well, the, my crowd think, you're not a man if you haven't done this. You ain't a man if you haven't tried that. You ain't a woman. Tell them to shut up. What you, what you need is some young people today in these public schools that have guts to stand up and say no. Amen. You need some negative thinkers in those schools. That's what you need. They say, you're not a man if you did this, not a man if you did that. Say, well, maybe I'm not, but I'm going to give you a good idea what one is if you don't shut up. <laughs> I mean, tell them no. So tell them no. Uh, it's the, it's every dirty trick I ever learned, I learned from an older boy coming up. Every one of them. And some want to be a part of the crowd, go along with the crowd, get along with the crowd. And that Bible said a companion of fools should be destroyed. I see this young lady here, you know, we used to sing, Jesus love me, this I know, because they bought me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Oh, here she is, and she's putting on the dog, you know, you think she's happy? A professing Christian? Why, well, that Bible said the backslider and heart should be filled with his ways. If you're a sheep, you can never be happy in a mud hole, lady. So just don't try it. Uh, there she is. Now here's here, here, here's this bunch here, and this is what this young man is. Uh, his idea of a good time is of the world, by the world, for the world. Boy, this is living, man. This is living. Bible's a strange book. You know what this young man happens? This young man, after he goes through this mess, after he goes through this thing, he says, "When he came to himself, that means he's temporarily out of his mind. When he came to himself." There they are. I, uh, I, uh, I wish uh, you, you're not all close enough here to the picture to see this, but I wish everybody here was close enough to this picture to see the space I'm going to draw over here and show you how this young man has, uh, uh, how, how, how improved, how sweet he, he looks, and, and how he's uh, found the ultimate answer, you know. He's got a beard now. That kind of, he's a hippy, yippy, huppy, jumpy or something, mother. And there he is going to this place, and every night, going every night, and there. Uh, Pretty soon he gets tired of going to it. He gets to know the first night, gets to know Sally and George and the guy that owns the place and the guy that, um, Bob knows the bartender and he pretty knows it. Pretty soon he knows the difference between a Cuba Libra and a Rum Collins and a Tom Collins and a sidecar and a boxcar and a Manhattan and a Marguerite and a Singapore sling. And pretty soon he, he's tired of going. Well, they say, everybody's gonna be there. Everybody's gonna be there. Everybody's gonna be there. No, they're not. I'm not. You say, well, who are you? I'm one. <laughs> don't say everybody. How many of you people in this building tonight don't use tobacco in any form? Can I see your hands? Oh, and how many of you people don't use alcoholic beverages in any form? Can I see your hands? Oh, I hear the little stuff get the martyrs and the lions in. How many of you kids between uh, 15 and 30 don't attend mixed dances of any kind? Let me see your hands. All right. Now, you folks that do those things, you don't mind us giving a testimony, do you? Oh, come on, now, you're broad-minded, aren't you? Don't you know you are? What happens is the world makes such a stink, you think everybody does those things, everybody don't do those things. One time a farmer down there in Mississippi, Alabama, had some construction come up, that man come out and drain, drain one of his catfish ponds out there, and they said, why? They said, there must be a thousand bullfrogs out there at night, and I can't sleep. They're back there, ribbit, 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 you know, all night long. And they drained that thing. I think they found four bullfrogs. <laughs> and they said, well, why'd you tell us there's a couple of hundred? He said, they're making such racket. I thought there's more of them. Don't you see what the world does? The world just dins in your ears, this stuff, day and night and night and day. Do you think that's normal for everybody? It's not. It's not. I think so this fellow's doing down there. He's, pre he's pretending he's a man of the world, see. He's putting on a show. 
Uh, there's nothing more stupid in this world than a young person trying to act like an older person, unless it's an older person trying to act like a younger person. <laughs> and, and you see the craziest stuff. I saw a guy one time down in Fort Walton get out of a car, and he must have been about, oh, maybe a little younger, maybe about 60, had a pot belly and chicken legs, you know. Looked like a leaky fountain pen ran down his legs. And he steps out of that car and he got on these Bermuda shorts, you know, looked like underwear to me. And Bermuda shorts and low heel patent leather shoes. And he gets out of that thing and walks across the gas station like this, you know. His pot belly sticking out and those chicken legs sticking out there. I thought to myself, what does that guy think he looks like anyway? Um, you can't imagine a fellow going like that in, in public looking like that unless he got some crazy idea what he looks like. You ought to, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to see it, you ought to come out of Pensacola and see that beach in the summertime. There's every type of costume thing. You think you're looking at 20 centuries of costumes on 10 different continents down there. Go by barefoot, sandals feet, boots feet, high heels, low heels, you know, thongs, leather, rubber, uh, short, short shorts, G-strings. <laughs> And they're going by there, and they got some have wool caps on, some have ear flaps on, some of them dress like Scotchmen, some of them dress like belly dancers. Everybody's acting. Everybody's acting. You see a woman about my age going by there, you know, about 300 pounds overweight, dressed in a bikini. Looks like, looks like an elephant in a diaper. <laughs> yeah, man. And, and you know what it is? It's a, that thing is, the world is putting on a show all the time. They're pretending. Back when I was a boy coming up and went in the army later on when I got older, we had what we call zoot shooters. I don't know if you ever seen a zoot shooter or not, but they all had the shoulders built throughout to here so they looked like they were men, you see. And then peg leg pants, and they had a, a watch chain they swung around this way. And they'd stand out there in the corner, you know, and swing this watch, you know, and cigarette drum, and I'm a tough guy, you know, tough guy. I saw, I saw some of those guys coming to service. That old G.I. Barber put them up in the chair. He took that thing and he went, the the cue ball them. And I, you think I'm lying, but I've seen those street hoods off New York and Chicago sit in that chair 18 and 19 crying because their pretty little locks would be shaved off. I'm not while acting tough out there with a switchblade. Some of those birds, they'd pass out if they had to gut a catfish. <laughs> you know what that stuff is? You know what that stuff is? That's pretense. It's show. It's pretense. And the young man kept going. He kept going. He kept going. Again, he got tired of going. I'm not going. Everybody going to be there. Everybody going to be there. Everybody going to be there. So he wasted his substance with riotous living. Spe- wasted it. Look down there. If you got a, a text open, look down there somewhere around verse oh, 14, 15, 16. And he's out there and he said, and when he had spent all, Money was gone. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And that citizen sent him into the field to feed his swine. And he was so hungry, he would have fain to fill his belly with a husk the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. What do you have? What's talking about there? When his money ran out, his friends ran out. Who makes the world go around? Shekels, boy. Shekels. You get rid of money and you'll some find your friends have suddenly vanished into some place. One of the greatest things about being saved and I know what it is. Well, the greatest thing about being saved is you're going to meet a bunch of people that are willing to help you out and love you no matter what you have. That ain't the old life. You can't count on that bunch in the old life. They'll sell you out as soon as the shekels go. And he spent all the rose of mighty famine in that land. He began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to sit in that country, unsaved man. And that said the same of the field to feed his swine, hogs, and he was so hungry, he wanted to eat what the hogs ate. It doesn't say that he did. It doesn't say he ever got that low or he eating hogs a lot. But he got that hungry. Because it said he was so hungry, he would have failed to fill his belly with the, the slop the hogs did eat, the swine did eat. And that fellow came to the end of his rope. And he came to the end of his rope real quick. And in a way, that's good. In a way, that's good. Uh, down south, we have a real problem with the gospel. Uh, I preach in places where, no, no, I'm not exaggerating anything. I preach in places where there are men in those uh, revivals that have been to two revival meetings every year since they were six years old. And they're not saved yet, and they're in their seventies. 
You talk about getting saved. Well, I reckon I'm going to get saved someday, preacher. Well, I'm aiming to. I'm aiming. I say, well, quit aiming and fire. <laughs> well, I could so I can live it. I'm going to that kind of stuff. Now, uh, they've heard the gospel all their life and put it off and put it off. I'm going to tell you something. If you're here tonight and you're unsaved and you're over and you're 50 years old, you are in bad trouble, buddy. I don't give a flip if you're the mayor, the president. I, if I talked before the UN, I wouldn't talk any different. I'm talking right now. When you get over 50 years old, you know, you know what happens as you get older? You get more self-righteous. You know why you do? Because you see so many people do things. Your sense of false confidence and security, the more you see Christians mess up, you think, well, if they're all right, I'm all right. No, you ain't. You're not right till you've accepted God's righteousness. You can't hide behind some Christian, but that's how you tend to get. I was doing personal work one time up in a field of the Carolina, someplace there. When I first began my ministry, the ladies breastfed the babies in the church. I mean, I began from the beginning. I'm back, I'm back up there on top of, you know, little Abner, uh, country. And, uh, they didn't have any nurseries. Didn't have electricity. They put their stuff in the mountains, cut a hole in the mountains, and I used to, that was their refrigerator over the winter. And you take, we, I preach, you had a kerosene lantern and a Coleman lantern to preach by. Every time you wave your hand, you almost set the building on fire. <laughs> that's, that's why I began back in there. And you take back in there, the, 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 their people back in there heard the gospel, I mean, two and three times a day for almost a century. And they're not saved yet. I told an old farmer back there one time, he's back in the backyard, nailed up slats on a pig shack. I came up along and shot him. I was young back in those days. I was about 30, 35, you know, 36, 37, along in there. I came to this old fellow, he was about 72 or 75, and I said, uh, how you doing, Pop? He said, well, okay, young fella, what you got to say for yourself? And we got talking. And I witnessed to him, told him how to get saved. And he said, would you like to get saved? He said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll study it for a while. I said, go on. I said, I bet you've been studying all your life, haven't you? He laughed. said, well, I reckon I have. I said, come on, Pop. I said, put on your, put on your hammer. Let's kneel right down here by the fence. You get saved, okay? And he said, I'm going to study for a while. And I said, you've been studying all your life, man. Well, I need to wait a little bit long and think some things through. And I said, you know something, old man? I said, you know what you are? You're a fool. And he glared at me and said, what you call me a fool for? I said, you, have no happiness in this life. You have no happiness in the world to come. You're a two-time loser. You're a sucker. You're a chump. You're a fool. That old man scratched his head and he said, Well, I reckon maybe you're right. I said, Come on, Pop. I said, Put on the hammer and let's kneel here and you get saved, okay? He said, I'm going to study for a while. No, he ain't. School's out. Door's locked. Rust in the lock. You're just good in hell with the door shut. All right, then he sat there. Keep, come on down there a little bit further, about verse 17, I guess, somewhere in there. And verse 17, sitting there, he's sitting out there and feeding the hogs and slopping the hogs. And he says, How many of servants of my fathers have bread to, pay, uh, to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise, go to my father, I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight, and I'm no more whether they call thy son coming down through there. When he came to himself. When he came to himself. That means he's temporarily out of it. That's what you say about a boxer when he is knocked unconscious in the ring. You say, he hadn't come to yet. When he comes to himself, then he's insane again. You see, you see, brethren, how different the Bible is. In, in the world, this is living. That's really living. Now you done lost your mind. <laughs> In the Bible, you lost your mind, now you're coming around. And he says, how many servants of my fathers have bread to spare, and I perish with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father, and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and in thy sight I'm no more whether to be called thy son. That fellow got comparing things, and so he's the end of his rope. And he said, my slave back in the plantation get better food than I do. I'm a fool to sit out with these hogs and die like this. Come the end of his rope. Come the end of his rope and came the end of his rope soon. Thank God he did as soon as he did. Like I say, the old geezers up there in the mountains of 80 and 90 years old haven't come to themselves yet. Ray is sitting there emancipated, torn up with drugs maybe, beat up with drugs, sitting about it while he couldn't get a job. Probably been arrested a couple of times in prison, that kind of thing. And things are over and he says to himself, I'm just a fool, just a fool. God gave him passions 
splendid as the sun, a part of nature's full and fertile heart. And now behold, what hath he done in folly's court and carnal pleasure's mart? He flung the wealth God gave him at the start, a soul for stupid sin and fun. At dawn he stood potential pure, with manhood and emotions keen, heart and soul afire. At noon he slouches. Life's fortune is spent in petty traffic, temporal, mean, a pauper, cursed by sensual desire. Out there slopping the hogs. The young lady, you know what the devil do with you when he's through with you? You'd be up there slopping pigs. When the world, listen, when the world applauds for you, isn't she beautiful, you know? Miss Chicago, Miss Illinois, Miss America, Miss Universe, when they applaud for you, the blood of Jesus Christ splatters off those hands. Those are the hands that nailed him to the cross. Spit, spot, spot, spot. Anytime you doubt that, next time you're on the double date, talk to that kid about his soul and watch what happens. Say, Charlie, you have been saved? You'll find which side your bread and butter on real quick. Amen. The world had no use for Christ. They got no use for your Savior. You'll be out there slopping hogs, what you'll be doing. And you're probably so hungry you could eat the stuff. You got sitting out there and thinking, I back home, uh, I'm at a decent meal, and what am I doing out here? And began to do some thinking. Car went by him. <laughs> you know. Some guy said, let's pick that poor kid up. And the wife said, don't touch him. He'd probably take your jack handle, knock you over the head with it, and steal the car. On they go by. A bunch of high school kids, college kids go by there. Hey there, buddy, what you doing? Pitch out a fifth out there or a half wine, wine bottle half full and thing. Bounce along beside that young buck. And he looked at that thing and he went. Pfft. You know why? When you get down the road, it sure do look different when you start out. That's why. And he sat out there and he began to think, how many servants of my fathers have bread to spare? I have perished with hunger. And I will arise and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Not just against people. Against God. David says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. you got to think. You can pay for any sin you commit me against me in a lifetime. You can pay for it. Because I ain't going to live any more much longer than you're going to live. You sin against a man, you can pay for it. Lifetime in jail. I'm asking you something. What happens when you sin against somebody that lives forever? Go and think about it four or five years. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Why, why listen, if you've got a double life or life or for murder or serial killer or something like that, what kind of sin are you going to have to commit to where you get sentenced eternally to burn? Well, it sure couldn't be some little thing like murder. That's kid stuff. You pay for that here. I've seen them pay. They take the hot squad. Boy, they ride old lightning. Kind of rape. You see the lights go down and come back up, boy. He's, he's riding old Sparky. I know how those things go. Now, what kind of a sin do you have to commit to burn forever? That'd have to be some sin, would it? Mm-hmm. Uh, a sin against me can be paid for 90, 100 years. But how are you going to pay for a sin against somebody who lives forever? You're going to pay forever. You said, isn't modern. No, that's just, just as ancient as air and sunshine and mountains and water. The one that made them. You sin against him, you pay for it forever. You see what this young fellow's doing out here? He's uh, reaping what he sowed. His ship's coming in. He sent out the ships when he was leaving home, and now he's got to unload his own ship. Sit out there a stump by the highway someplace, trying to get a ride. Nobody pick him up. That fellow sitting out there, you know what he's doing? He's reaping. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that should he also reap. He that sows the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And be not weary and well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Uh, he uh, loaded the boat up, and now he's got unloaded himself. Did you know that if Elvis Presley lived to be 60 years old, he'd be a Republican? <laughs> And the Beatles all would be Republicans. They'd be conservative. Do you know why when a fellow gets past 40, he starts getting conservative? Work on a while. You say, well, he burns out. Ah, oh, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. Some of you birds are up there now. Right now, if you had to keep up me out there on the blacktop and your bare feet, you couldn't go two miles. And I'd be going four. 
I didn't burn out at 40 and didn't burn out at 50. I'm still, you know, playing hockey with these guys 25 and 30 years old. You want to see what a hockey puck looks like? Like that. <laughs> that thing come there 90 miles an hour and pop you there, boy, you'll feel it for days. Now, do you think I burned out or something? You know why you get conserved when you're past 40? Because when you get past 40, you have time to see some of the ships come back in that you sent out before you was 20. And it's scary. Some of you folks just haven't lived long enough to see your ships come in. Someday they'll come in. I get up to be about 27 years old, and the Lord say, Okay, Ruckman, reaping time has come. Go down the dock. I go down to Pier 5 in Honolulu or Pier 9 in Manila, I forget which. And I go down there, and I take my ship, and in it comes. And I pick up the hatch and look in there, and the, boy, what a stink. I mean, dead bodies and eggshell, rotten eggshells, coffee grounds, and broken glass and dead shrimp. My God, what a stink. I said, I can't unload this thing. The Lord said, you send it out. I said, I didn't send that out. And the Lord said, well, you always reap more than you sow, don't you? Put a corn ear, ear of corn on the ground. You don't plant an ear that long. You plant something as big as your fingernail. Look what comes up. And I go down the wharf, and I find one of my buddies, and I say, hey, would you help me? He says, why is that, Ruckman? I said, I got a ship down here I got to unload, and I can't unload it. He said, I can't help you. I got five of mine, and I got to unload up here. <laughs> and that's where he is. That's where he is. There are two cups a young person can drink of. You can take the cup of the Lord and call upon the salvation, uh, uh, the cup of salvation, call upon the name of the Lord, or you can keep, take what the Bible calls the cup of devils. And the Bible says, look not upon the wine when it's red, it gives its color in the cup, or moves itself aright. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. The Bible says in the bottom of that wine cup there's a serpent coil up to strike you and poison you from head to foot. And that's where he got. Do you ever see those two cups? You look at one of you holding up like this and it sparkles and you hear the click of the dancing heels, see the skirt swirling, you know, and see the flashing teeth and hear the music and you say, boy, yeah, man, that's for me. You take a swig of that and say, yeah, that stuff's good. Little lady, you say, this stuff isn't quite as good as I thought it was. Little lady, you say, this stuff is bad. Little lady, you say, i got to quit this stuff. Little lady, you say, I can't quit it. And you get down by my thing, and boy, that thing calls up and poison <laughs> Boy, you head to foot. Now you take the other cup, the Lord's cup. You look at it and you say, my God, what's that? <laughs> you take a sip and you say, poo, it's killing me. <laughs> You take another sip, you say, well, I might as well go ahead. You take another sip, you say, this isn't, stuff isn't as bad as I thought it was. And you begin to get a bit more, you say, this stuff's getting good. And it gets more, and you say, this stuff's getting great. And you get down to the bottom of that thing, and down to the bottom of that cup, there's a well of water springing up in everlasting life. Amen. You see, one tastes, ga- one tastes uh, good and gets bad, and one tastes bad and gets good. No second-hand information, folks. I'm just... Not just preaching, I'm just telling you how it is. I was on the wrong side of the fence for 27 years, and I moved pretty fast. I, when Q Pyle led me to Christ in the record room of that radio station, I looked like I was 45. He was 35 and looked like he was 15. Clean living. <laughs> I was sitting behind that console, drums in a dance band at night, disc jock in the daytime, I was sitting there, and Hugh Pyle, that country preacher, came in and sat down and began to preach. And the Lord said, now you sit fellow there. He said, you talk to him when, you, when he comes out. I said, oh, he don't know nothing. And I, the Lord said, now if you don't think that's a man, you just check him when he comes out. Oh, that fellow man, he never drank nothing stronger than buttermilk. And I looked back, and the Lord said, if you don't think he's a man, just check him. So I said, okay, I'll check him. So he comes up and he goes by the door, going out the door to the radio studio. I said, hi, preacher, what do you know? He turned around and says, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you know? Man, that was a nasty turn of events. <laughs> I like to swallow my stogie. And I said, well, I don't know him. He said, would you like to know him? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, uh, would you be willing to ask him to save you? I said, I guess so. He said, come here. And he, I've been reading a stolen Bible for about two months and taking convert course with a Jesuit priest. 
about the end of my rope. I'd already studied Buddhism and all that stuff years ago. And I went back in the record room, and he took out a Bible, and he said, do you believe this is the Word of God? And I said, yeah, that's it. I, I wouldn't have said that otherwise. The last time overseas in the Philippines, my company commander pulled a Bible on me. He said, Ruckman, you're always reading stuff. Let me read you something out of this. I said, I'll put that away. It's a lot of baloney. I call that book baloney. Uh, Lord had one fixed for me, boy. By the time I'd read that, read that thing drunk, heading for a drunkard's grave, I said, that's it. And he said, uh, do you believe you're a sinner? I said, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. He said, you believe Christ died for sinners? I said, well, I guess he did. I wasn't trying to be funny. I didn't know. I know the priest said he did, but I didn't know whether the priest was lying or not. And he said, do you believe he could save a sinner? I said, beats the fire out of me. He said, would you ask him to save you? I said, sure. So I took his hand and he said, now in your own words, ask Christ to save you. Now if he'd known how I was going to pray, he wouldn't have said that. <laughs> because any guy came up where I came up and the way some of you came up, uh, a four letter word was every other word. And these guys you work with during the daytime and cuss all, all day, a lot of those fellows, they don't even know what they're saying, honest to God. They just get used to talking that way. The blankety blank this and the blankety blank that and the blankety blank. And that's why I was. I don't know anything. And I took him by the hand. He said, now just in your old words, ask Christ to save you. And I said, I don't know how to pray. And I didn't. I knew, you know, Hail Mary and you know, I Father Trump and him, help me name King to come flip the beads and all that stuff. But I didn't know how to pray. And he said, just in your own words, he said, ask Christ to save you. So I bowed my head. I said, Lord, I'm a blankety blank sinner and I'm going to hell sure as blankety blank if something don't happen pretty blankety blank quick. <laughs> I mean, I cussed clear through the prayer. And got toward the end of it and said, uh, God save my soul for Christ's sake, amen. <laughs> and I looked up at him I, and he, I said, what you laughing at? He said, nothing. He said, you mean that prayer? I said, you GD right, I meant that prayer. <laughs> and I did, see? I wasn't trying to be smart. I did, I meant it. And he said, if you meant that prayer, you're saved. I said, I don't feel any different. He said, you're not supposed to feel any different. I said, how I know I'm saved? And he said, yes, no, you just know. I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. I said, I do not. He said, you do so. I said, I don't either. Getting kind of hairy there for a minute. And he reached and pulled out a Bible and showed it to me. And he said, read it. And I read it. It said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. God says there, you know you have it. Now, do you know it, don't you? I looked at that thing and I said, well, uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess I do. He just said, does it say yes or no? I says, no. He said, do you know? I said, well, well, I never got such a mess in all my life. I've never had, I've never had any trouble arguing with people. I can always think of something to say in less than two seconds. But that guy had me up a tree boy. I was between a rock and a hard place. I thought if I said I was saved, I was lying because I didn't feel like I was. And I said, well, and he said, you don't think God's a liar, do you? I said, no, 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 I don't think God's a liar. Well, God said, there you know you're saved. I do you know it, don't you? I said, well, uh, yeah, I know. And I felt like I was lying when I said it. <laughs> but boy, next Youth for Christ night, Saturday night, I went out there, boy, and I heard the first gospel message I ever heard in my life. College graduate, 27 years. Heard it the first time. A fellow can be in the United States for 27 years. The college education never hear it. They sang just as I am without one plea. I never heard it before. But that thy blood, you didn't have to sing two stanzas for me. Now, some of you folks, you got to sing four or five stanzas before you come. I think your problem is you're just stupid, to be frank with you. I mean, I knew something good when I saw it. And But if you came through what I came through, you'd know something good if you saw it. The trouble is you haven't had enough mud and sewage and garbage yet to satisfy you. That's your problem. I didn't need two stand. They sang yes, I am without bam, I was down there. A twelve year old girl came down with me. You think we didn't make a pair? <laughs> I had a black shirt and a yellow necktie and a mustache. <laughs> Weighed 185 pounds and 28 inch waistline, so mean I didn't love myself. I could have a guy, I could have a guy six feet two jump up down my belly in his boots and it wouldn't rupture anything. And four cigars in this pocket and four cigars in that pocket. And here's this 12 year old girl standing beside me, you know. Whosoever will, let him come. They all get singing, you know. Blessed be the time that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds. I'm standing there, shaking hands. I thought I was shaking hands with angels. 
If you told me some of those old women were talking about each other and the kids were necking out there in the parking lot and the deacons were stealing money, I'd be ready to shoot you. <laughs> Live and learn, eh, boy? <laughs> I just came out of the night so black and everything else was clean, you know. And uh, they finished that thing, and that, that night, the buses didn't run that end of town that night. It was out too far in the country, so I had to hitchhike back. I didn't have any car. At that time, my family was busted up, and I was drinking myself to death, didn't have a car. And I was walking back there, and nobody picked me up. And about that time, the devil got to working on me again. Fine bunch of Christians. Wouldn't even give you a ride home. You call it Christianity? Those fine bunch of Christians, anybody give off you a ride home? Yeah, Christian, I was Christian, you know. <laughs> And about that time, a car stopped right by me. And the guy said, hey, you want a lift? I had that happen out here on uh, Sunday morning. I got up and did a little walking, to exercise, went around a couple of locks down there on the highway, and it began to rain cats and dogs, and you know what. <laughs> and I came around there, and I had my suit on and everything, and began to get soaked and no umbrella. And the half the building around there don't have any awnings on them. And I began to trot toward the motel, and... Praying, God help me, God stop the rain, God get me, get me soaking wet. They'll all, it don't mind me any. I mean, I can preach soaking wet, but you'd be shocked. I know you people. <laughs> and, and I said, God give me help. And a car stopped right in front of me. The lady said, are you going to church? And I said, yeah. She said, well, get in. And I, it was a Christian woman, a Baptist. Just happened to come out of a driveway there before I was crossing something and got me, well, here I'm out there walking home and, you want to ride? I said, oh, yeah, I can ride, got in. Sat down, got his wife. They've been at church. And they're coming back from church. And uh, I sat in the back seat, and they said, we were at church tonight, and saw you accept Christ your Savior. I said, yeah, I did that. And they said, you'll never regret doing that. I said, no, I guess I won't. You know, I didn't know nothing. I said, green, I'd, well, you stuck me in the ground, I'd have rooted. <laughs> and I, I'm looking out the window like this, and this dark night, and I'm thinking, yeah, you got to learn to talk. Best thing you ever did. He got your car here, got your family with you. Well, what do you know about it? You know, what's your thinking? You know. And he didn't. He don't know what I'm thinking. He's just talking. And he said, "Yes, sir. That's a, that's a, the the greatest thing a man can do. You did the right thing tonight." His wife said, "Amen. You certainly did, young man." I said, "Yeah, yeah. I suppose so." And I'm thinking to myself, "Yeah, you got to learn how to talk. You know, you got a job. And I'm out of work and all this kind of stuff." And then he said, "Without knowing what I'm thinking, he says, you know, he said, I never had a mother or father." So I was raised in an orphanage. And he said, I accepted Jesus Christ, my Savior, when I was 11 years old. Ever since then, I've been just happy as a dead pig in the sun. <laughs> Woo! I said, Lord, I'll shut up, I'll shut up, I'll shut up, I'll shut up. <laughs> and I got back my little flat there, you know, 10 cent a bit, a can to spit in. And I got it and knelt down in the dark, and the devil got to work me over again. You crazy run around here at night, you're not saved. What do you mean saved? What do you mean to say? You can't live it. You'll be back where you were before very long. What do you mean save all that stuff? You can't live it. Your family's all, what about your family? And the Lord said, when the Holy Spirit witnesses, it's never this startling, loud thing you hear these charismatics from with. It's always still and quiet. The wisdom from above, from above is first pure, then peaceable, full of good fruits. And I'm kneeling there, and the Lord says, it's all right now, Pete. It's all right now. I try to worry myself out of it. You're a kook. Run around to this Bible stuff. You're getting to be a fanatic. You better see a psychiatrist in the morning. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit says, it's all right now, Pete. It's all right now. It's all right now. Just bring peace to my troubled soul, boy. And let me tell you, I knew I was saved then. I had absolute assurance I was saved. Well, it's 54 years later now. Amen. You know what the Lord is telling me? It's all right now, Pete. It's all right now. Well, my buddy said, oh, you're just tripping, man. You, 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 you got to get a drug dream, man. You're a fantasy. You're not really saved. It's just like taking a trip on drugs. I said, brother, but it is. I got the best junkie in the world you ever saw, and I got mine free, and my trip lasted 54 years, and you just didn't run three weeks. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. All right, he says, I will arise and go to my father. Then thank God for verse 20. I think it's verse 20. And he arose. Is that that verse? And he arose. Thank God for that verse. He didn't sit there and die on his stumps. And I'm going to say something in favor of this young man. I haven't been very oh, 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 complimentary of him. Because in the Bible, it's all backwards. In the Bible, that's the, in the, in the, in the world, that's the hero. 
and that's the, the, the hero's girlfriend and the love triangle, you see. But the hero of this story is not the young man. It's the old man. It's the father. For you, the hero always has to be a young man. Karate kicking, punching, killing, blowing away AK-47, all that kind of junk. And that Bible, that fellow is nothing but a profligate, profligate, unappreciative, conceited bum. But I'll say one thing for him. When that young kid said he was going to do something, he didn't waste all day. He got it done. That young fellow said, I'm going out the far country. Off he went. I'm going to live like the devil. He did. I'll arise, go to my father, and he gets up. I'll say that for him. He got up, got off the stump. Now, an old man, like I say, in Carolina, Alabama, and Georgia, and Mississippi, has been sitting that stump there for 40, 56 years and hasn't got up yet. Thank God he got up. And listen, when he got up, don't you know what happened? Don't you know what happened? You probably wouldn't know unless you've been saved late in life. Now, if you're saved after you're 30 or 40 or 50, you know what I'm getting ready to say. But if you're saved young, you wouldn't understand this. You know what happened when he got up? Well, he took about three steps and one of his old buddies showed up. Old buddy, buddy. He's going to be right there. And he said, hey, man, where are you going? So I'm going back home. Never can make it. 300 miles, you're going to walk it. You're never going to make it. Well, maybe I won't, but I sure am hungry. I'm sure tired of this hog slop. He took a couple more steps, and one of his old other brothers showed up and said, you know, you old man go whip a tar to you when you get back. You know that, don't you? Well, that may be, that may be true, but I can smell that red-eyed gravy and cat's head biscuits and corn in the cob. I just, I'm going. Two more steps. Hey, man, what about that blonde, that brunette she said you're going to bring back with you? Oh, you take it, make a tiny mess with him. A couple more steps. Hey, man, how about that Mercedes bench? You said, I can't make the payments. You make the payments. And he walked along there. After he walked about a mile, his feet got kind of pink. And he walked about two miles. He had blisters. And he walked three miles. And the blood began to splotch out there on the highway behind him. He didn't care. He going home. You know why some of you fellows don't get off the thing and go on home? You got a taste for hog slop. That's your problem. You get tired of eating the husk of this world and you get hungry for God, there are not enough devils in hell to keep you from Christ. Amen. Your problem is you got a taste for Yeah, that's what that's the problem. Right. I preached one time down in Mobile, Alabama, and got the invitation. There's an old boy back there, about six feet six, farm boy, and he'd been under conviction the whole service, this thing here. And when he got up the invitation, he reached across the seat in front of him and hit his buddy on the back, like to knock him over two benches. <laughs> And he said, Sam, he said, I'm going down there to get something real. Down he went. Down he went. You can't keep a man from God when he gets hungry for God. And the trouble is, you folks, a lot of you, you're not hungry. You're satisfied with pig slop. That's your problem. You're welcome. There's more where that came from. <laughs> All right, when he was yet, when he, keep on reading. He arose and came to his father. And, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him and ran and had compassion and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. And he didn't get to finish it. He was going to say, make me as one of the hired servants. And his daddy wouldn't let him. His daddy said, don't tell me about the rest of it. And he said, bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Bring forth shoes, put them on his feet. Bring out a ring, put on his hand. Bring here the fatted calf, and let's kill it. And let's eat and be merry, for this my son was dead as alive, and he was lost, but now is found. Look at that last verse down there. And they began to be merry. Just said they began, don't it? When did they finish? They never did. When you come home and trust Christ, your Savior, God Almighty, he spreads a bank for you up there across the sky at the marriage of the Lamb, you sit down on a feast that never ends. Amen. That's what's going on. Now notice it said, he, he had compassion upon him and ran and fell upon his neck and kissed him. Now what does that mean? That means the old man saw the boy coming before the boy saw the old man. That means the old man was waiting for him. How you know he's waiting for him? You know he's waiting for him because you don't fight a calf overnight. And you take that, when, when, you, when you try to visualize these things, and I try to visualize them, and maybe I haven't got the picture right all the time, but when I see this, this scene, what I've seen is old antebellum home down south in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, on a plantation. The fellow had servants. 
this fellow's going to go back and sleep in the servants' quarters, work out in the fields, chop cotton. And the old man's still waiting for him. The old man been waiting for him for days and weeks, waiting for him, praying, praying all the time, walk the floor at night. And his wife say, won't you ever come to bed? That boy was no good anyhow. Had some kind of bad blood in him somewhere. Quit your worrying yourself to death and get some sleep. And the old man walked the floor at night. God, please save him. God, please bring him back. God, you know, he's young and he's so stupid and he's so foolish. And oh, God, don't let the devil get him. And oh, God, have mercy upon him. God, you know where he is tonight. All that stuff for days and days and days. And then in my mind's eye, I see him out there in that balustrade around that porch, those porch roofs, those old antebellum homes, looking out across that plantation, long about, uh, long about sundown. He looks out across there, and about that time, the, uh, the colored man comes up and says, Boss, he said, Mrs. Supper's ready. You better come on. He said, Okay, I'll be there in a minute. And he said, Mrs. says it's on the table. He said, I know you're right. I know you're right. I was just watching the sun going down there over the sunset. And the colored man said, boss, the sun ain't going down over there, it's going down over yonder. <laughs> he said, I know you are, you're right, but I was just watching her down, shining that, those trees down there by the lane. And he got looking down about that time he saw something come that lane, and he got up, and it fell down, and it got up, and it fell down, and he said, yonder, here he comes, and broke his neck getting down the stairs to get to him. You know what I'm talking about? If you started for this all tonight to get right, God would beat you there. The Lord is more anxious to get you right than you are to get right. That's what kind of a God you're dealing with. This great omnipotent, this great big bang out in some place trying to invent hydrogen atoms and stuff and carry on the galaxies and the star clusters. That ain't the God of that Bible. The God of that Bible, if he was back in the farthest confines of the universe making new galaxies and saw you head his way, he'd run to meet you. He'd beat you there. People have all funny ideas about those kind of things. Ran to meet him. And the, and at the end the sun starts, and the sun starts, and how, what, how does he start? He comes home and says, Father, I realize that under the uh, tension and stress of the modern age, I was able to adjust my innate potentialities and capacities in such a heteronomous way as to overcome the influence. They, oh, shut your mouth. I mean, I mean, some people got some education. They couldn't get to Christ they would try, if they tried. God doesn't say smart aleck like that. Uh, you, well, listen, you come to God like a pauper, you go away like a prince. And you come to God like a prince, you go away like a pauper with the blood running off you. Well, don't go, don't, don't start all that stuff. You want to get a blessing? You come to God and say, look, I'm dirty. I got this stuff all over me. I can't get clean. I'm tired of this. Take me back. I'll scrape the black off the parts of your kitchen and take the dandelions out between the bricks if you want to. But for God's sake, clean me and take me back. And you come to God like that, brother, he'll slide open the wardrobe of heaven and take out a robe of righteousness and throw it over your shoulders and you out that door down a foot off the ground. Singing, God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. You come to God like a prince, you go away like a beggar. You come to God like a beggar, you go away like a prince. That's all it is of that. He said, Miss, my son was lost and is found. He was dead and is alive. And they began to be merry. Just started having a good time and never quit having a good time. Is that the case with you? Out in the wilderness, wild and drear. Sadly, I wandered for many a year, driven by hunger and filled with fear. I will arise and go backward once more, my steps retrace, seeking my heavenly Father's face, willing to take but a servant's place. I will arise and go back to my father and home, back to my father and home. I will arise and go back to my father and home. Oh, that I never had gone astray. Life was all radiant with hope one day. Now all its treasures I've thrown away. Dare I rise and go? Something is saying God loves me still, though I have treated his love so ill. I must not wait 
for the night grows chill, I must arise and go back to my father and home, back to my father and home. I will arise and go back to my father and home. You know what the young fellow got when he got home? He got what he went out to get. You know what young men like? I'll tell you what you like. You like good clothes and good food and money. And that young man came back and he got a gold ring for coming back and he got a fatted calf to eat and he got rejoicing and got him a robe of righteousness and shoes on his feet. What you want, young fella, is in the Father's house. And Christ said, no man come to the Father but by me. God help you. Father, bless your word tonight. And I pray you'll honor it. May it bear fruit in the lives of these Christians that have heard. I pray especially for the young people here tonight, the ones that have kind of leaned that way, and hearing the stories, and getting the news items, and watching the boob tube, and this world has begun to get glamorous to them and desirable. And I pray for they waste their life out there with the hogs and the hog slop. They'll return to the Father. Well, let's pray a little while in prayer. Wait and God in prayer a little while. And some of you tonight probably need to just come to the altar here and kneel here a while and we won't rush you. And if you want, don't want anybody to deal with you, we won't. If you want some help, raise a hand when you come. If you don't want any help, nobody's going to bother you. You don't have to go through a priest or a preacher to get to God. You got to deal with him personally. But we, we're not, we're not here to, to treat you cold. If you want some help, somebody to pray with you, be glad to. I'll show you something in the scripture. But just between you and the Lord, that's your business and His. Why don't you just come down tonight and just stay a while and get settled. We won't rush tonight and let you talk things over. That book said, if we confess our sins, He is